Hey, it's Mr. Norton, and we're going to continue our second lecture on the Renaissance, and we're going to be focusing on humanism in our video today. So um, one of the things that we need to keep in mind with humanism that becomes very confusing for students is that there tends to be three types of humanism that we cover in the course. And so uh, one is just going to be kind of a basic understanding of what humanism is. There's going to be civic humanism, which we'll get to. It's basically trying to um, better the state um, and make improvements. Um, but again, we'll get into that a little bit later. And then there's going to be Christian humanism too, which we won't necessarily cover um, in depth today, but I'll go ahead and kind of lead off with that one. Christian humanism is going to basically be an attempt to get back to the roots of Christianity because some of the observations that are going along at this time is that the church has essentially gotten away from uh, basically behaving how it, it's described it should inside of the Bible. And so you have individuals who want to make, basically go back to the humble beginnings and basically be more like how Jesus acted. Because if you look around at the time, the church is basically acting um, in ways like, let's say the Pope is very, very wealthy. And if you take a look at the Bible, Jesus um, wasn't a wealthy person. So it seems rather odd that the leader of the church is having all this money and when the person who the religion is about didn't have a lot of money. So they want to kind of go back to how Jesus was in those days. Um, there will be people who make those pushes that, um, that are, well, they're killed because of it. So uh, you'll kind of learn as the course goes on is that it's not a great idea to try and challenge the Catholic Church in the 1400s because in some cases it does cost you your life. So let's kind of get into what humanism is. Humanism in general is this focus on the individual. Remember that when we're talking about things prior to the Renaissance, it was very much religion-centered. So now this is just one of those ways in which religion is kind of starting to take a back seat and people begin to focus more on themselves. Okay. Um, so um, one of the people that we need to focus on for the most part is going to be Petrarch. Um, he is going to be an individual that um, is considered the father of humanism. We're going to be spending some, uh, some time uh, when we have our in-person meetings uh, reading through Petrarch. Um, so you can get an idea of what his ideas were. Okay. Um, now, humanism also was involved in education. So you have to start thinking to yourself, who's going to receive the education that was based on humanism? Well... If we go back to our three estates that we discussed in our last lesson together, um, you know it's probably not going to be the third estate because the third estate were, for the most part, um, with the working class. Now, obviously, there were some exceptions because you had people who were wealthy, um, but that's not going to be the rule. So, for the most part, it's the members of the second estate, the nobility, who gain access to these humanistic, humanistic styles of education. Um, and the idea of these schools is to basically prepare you for everyday life because the argument was is basically not everybody can be lawyers, not everyone um, can be philosophers, and not everyone can, can basically become doctors. But there are there is an education that you can have that prepares you for things that, well, aren't involved with those careers. Um, so... One of the things that also makes this um, very possible is the invention of movable type. Um, so that's called the printing press. That's something that is focused on too. Um, so the thing that becomes very useful is that um, prior to this time, before the printing press was created, essentially anytime you wanted to have a book, it had to be copied by hand. And we know how painstaking that would be to copy entire texts by hand. I mean, could you imagine if you've ever seen a Bible, how many words in there? Imagine if you wanted to have a copy of that. I mean, somebody would have to take the time to write down every single word and put it together. Books were extremely expensive because of that and weren't easy to find. Um, so with the printing press, you could make things that were easy too. The other thing that was nice about the printing press is that it allowed copies of things to be made in vernacular. And so if you don't know what vernacular is, is that's the common language. Okay, So uh, if something was written in Greek, I mean the chances of you finding it in your native language probably not too likely because of the painstakingly uh, long and difficult task it would be to translate it over and make just one copy. 
with the printing press, you can just basically pump out page after page after page and then assemble it later. So that's one of the things that you need to be mindful of is that vernacular and being able to print in vernacular, the language of the, the people who, I'm sorry, having it being printed in the language that people speak uh, and read and write is certainly an advantage. Now, some of the things that we look at too about the early church, how they didn't even have um, like services in vernacular, you would go to church and you would have an entire um, you would have an entire service be conducted in Latin. So if you're not fluent in Latin, you would just kind of be sitting there and have no idea what it is that those individuals were speaking about. Okay, so uh, moving on. Sorry. Now, as far as civic humanism. Basically, it's this idea that the duty of the individual is to be active and live for the improvement of the state. So there'll be some test questions that you get to where it shows improvements of like the downtown area or just the, the major cities themselves. And it asks what type of humanism would be involved with that. Because it's the improvement of the state itself, this would be civic humanism. Okay. Um, now, some other things, too, is that... Um, Early civic humanists kind of thought that you can only grow morally and intellectually through participation in life of the state. Um, so that's kind of their little uh, train of thought. Now, now humanists before that kind of were isolationists and didn't really contribute to the contribution of the contribute <laughs> didn't really contribute to the advancement of the state. So that's how uh, civic humanism has changed a little bit over time as well. Okay, education in the Renaissance um, basically. Uh, we kind of have um, some themes here that will, uh, will appear later on, too, because as I'm, I'm looking over my notes again, um, uh, one of the connections I can make would be to the Enlightenment is basically that um, society can be changed through education. Now, when we get to the, to the Enlightenment, basically, we're talking about society can just be changed, period. It's, it's not necessarily something that um, it has to be done through education. It, it goes beyond that. So we'll, we'll be getting a little bit further into that. But um, for the most part, uh, the type of education that you would receive would be one in history, moral philosophy, eloquence, uh, letters like grammar and logic, poetry, mathematics, astronomy, and music. And if we go back to what we had for, the, um, for our previous lesson where we talk about the characteristics of what a noble should be like, um, a lot of these things actually fall into there. So if you're looking for a noble too, um, that was uh, the, the Castellon piece, uh, Book of the Courtier, or Courtier. Um, basically, um, you would have all of these, plus you'd be able to like play, a, play an instrument, and that would be the music portion, and you'd be you know, skilled in fighting in government too. So um, Humanism's influence on history. Um, so one of the things that you need to really pay attention to, and this becomes... Um, something that usually comes up in a test question as well is that prior to the Renaissance and the influence of humanism, what you have is many people look at uh, historical events as being highly influenced by God, and instead of um, instead of focusing on what the individual was able to accomplish. So that was how it was before the Renaissance and humanism comes into play. So then what they start doing is taking God out of the equation and looking more for um, the actual contributions and accomplishments of the individual. So that makes more sense because when we talked about humanism before, is it's more of a look at individualism. And so when we take an approach like that to history, we start taking religion out of it and looking at more of the talents and accomplishments of the individuals that are involved in them. Okay. Now, is there, is there a renaissance for the women? Not really. Um, now, there were women who did receive some of this humanistic education, um, but it was very rare, and the only women who had access to that would have likely been women who lived in the households of very wealthy individuals who felt that it was necessary and beneficial for them to be included on that. Um, <clears throat> but as we talked before in a previous lecture, is that women were essentially subject to the domination of men and would not receive any sort of real equality. And of course, some people still maintain that um, even in today's society that women don't have exact equality to men. And we know that, you know, we, at least as far as this course goes, we don't see women gain uh, some basic rights uh, equal to men like voting and things until around 1920 or so. So we're going to see that push throughout the course for women to continue to try and gain rights as we move along. But they don't really make any substantial strides 
towards accomplishing that until the early 1900s. So as I talked about with uh, earlier with the printing press, um, books were hard to find and very expensive before this. Um, one of the things that tends to be a focus of a lot of the questions uh, regarding the printing press is the Gutenberg Bible. Um, and that was a Bible that I believe was written in German. And so, the, again, the advantage of the printing press was essentially that you could go ahead and produce things in vernacular and mass produce them and get them out to people. So a little short lecture today. I mean, it's only about 10 and a half minutes, so there's not going to be a whole lot of um, activities to do when we get into regular class with this. Um, as far as checking for understanding, we're going to probably spend more of our time looking at primary text. So that's going to wrap it up, and we'll be getting into another lecture in a few days. We'll see you then.